go. Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand together. Let us worship our Lord this morning. I hope you've come with a heart this morning full of love and worship for our God. Let's, let's sing. All the earth will sing your praises. You turn, you take our sins away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down, you saved us through the cross. And our hearts are changed because of your great love. You said in three days you will arise you did and you're alive you rule you reign you said you're coming back again and I know that you will all the earth will sing your praises all the earth you turn, you take the winds away, oh God. You give, you gave your life away for us. You came down. You saved us through the cross. Our hearts are changed because of your great love. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would arise. You did, and you're alive. You ruled, you made. Again, and I know that you will. All the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. You live, you die, you said in three. You will rise, you did, and you're alive. You rule, you reign, you said you're coming back again. And I know that you will, all the earth will sing your praises. All the earth will sing your praises. Hallelujah. All the earth will sing God's praises. You may be seated. Pastor Nick. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Mike should be on. Nope. Yep. Okay. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. Um, I have a few announcements, and then we'll head into our time of prayer and preparation this morning. Um, one, I want to let you know, uh, for the, uh, the few of you that it affects, um, we will not be having youth group this coming Wednesday. The reason for that is I'll be out of town with my family, so we're going to be a, away this week visiting Megan's dad down in Northern California. Um, if you really need to get a hold of me, if there's something really important, you can reach me by phone and text. We're not that far away. Um, so uh, that's easy enough. And we will plan to be back with you again next Sunday, which is when we will have our guest missionaries with us. Um, so we were blessed. Uh, we had the Bachelet family over at our house. 
yesterday for a bit in the morning and they are a wonderful sweet young family that you will um, in a very short time come to adore they are very easy to talk to and comfortable to be with so i i hope that you will take a little bit of time next week in the service and just after the service um, to listen to them to meet with them and talk with them Unfortunately, sometimes we like to hang out with missionaries for a while and have them for a meal and those kind of things. We are actually their last stop next Sunday in the Northwest before they are headed out um, to start preparing. And the goal is for them to be back on the field in Honduras in December. So um, they are leaving right after, after they're done with us in the morning service. They're, they're headed out. Also wanted to remind you, there's a few things in the back, but just remind you there is a Bible drive going on right now, so you can find information for this. The, the easy information is just bring in any used Bibles that you have uh, between now and the beginning of November, and I will take them with me when I go to annual conference in November, and we're going to celebrate that as a whole conference, uh, bringing those Bibles to be redistributed out to, um, to families, to individuals that need the Word of God in their hands. So uh, feel free to participate in that. Okay. I think that's all my main announcements. I did want to give you an update. I've been uh, communicating with uh, the Jaeger family this week, and uh, I was very pleased to hear yesterday that Stephen had some very positive changes and um, was able to be sitting up, and they are hopeful that sometime today he will be getting into uh, a regular room and out of the ICU. So we're, we're thankful for those updates and those changes there. I'm sure you have plenty more requests on your heart and mind and uh, the people, the circles that you are connected with. Um, so this is a good time to compose our hearts and prepare for worship as well as bring those those burdens those requests to the lord so let's take some time quietly just to let you um, be with the father and then uh, i'll bring us back together in prayer in just a moment Lord, thank you for this precious moment gathered together before you um, that we meet in this special way to worship you, to celebrate you, to, um, to humble ourselves before you and, and listen to your word, listen to your direction, seek your, um, your guidance, your helping us to understand and put into practice what you, what you have already spoken and revealed and made known to us. Lord, may we walk in harmony with you, uh, sub, uh, coming to grips with, submitted to your rightful ruler, rule as Lord, and, um, and putting into practice, applying um, how it is you say we can walk with you, look like you, act 
invite you to take into our hearts and minds your values, your purposes. Lord, um, we want to bear your image well in this world, that not just so that we might persevere, although may you bless us with perseverance, but that we might build one another up in encouragement as well as that we might bear witness to those who do not yet believe, have not experienced a cleansing of their life and a freedom from sin, that they would see that reality made manifest within us, that they would um, be curious, be bewildered by your incredible power and, and have a desire to, uh, to seek after you, to hunt for you, to uh, not just to understand, but to experience you and know you as their God. Lord, may we, uh, may we be faithful to encourage, to help, to answer questions when asked that we would be ever more submitting and, and um, seeking after you ourselves, that we might be able to share of our experience and have others come to understand, come to believe. Lord, may you be glorified. I pray that you would Pray that you would give your people here eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive of your word and your, your character, your, what you have revealed of yourself today, that we might know you and walk with you. Lord Jesus, we love you. In your name, amen. Let's worship together. Please stand once again. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful. Streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Go walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's taken the offering blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious
my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine and not I. But through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my Son, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on. In weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley He will lead. Oh, the night has been won. And I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No faith I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price it has been paid For Jesus fled and suffered for my pardon And He was raised to overthrow the grave To this I hold, my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory Children are dismissed for their Bible study time. Pastor Nick.
while we're waiting for all the little ones to make it out. Um, we will be in Matthew chapter 26 again today. We are going to be picking up right where we left off last week. Um, so you can turn to Matthew chapter 26, and in a little bit here we'll pick up in verse uh, 36. Actually, I'll probably back up to verse 35. No, not for it. Verse 30. There we go. Verse 30. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for how you've already brought us together. Thank you for um, the way your spirit stirs our heart and, and begins to focus our thinking that we would be ready to examine your word, listen to your revelation, what you show us and tell us about yourself how you reveal our inner beings and the truth of who we are and how you speak words of life and grace. Even, even when they must first start with uh, correction, chastisement. Um, Lord, we thank you for your goodness and grace, your love poured out and made manifest Thank you that you are still living and active and we experience you daily. <clears throat> we see the evidence of your actions and your, your goodness. Lord, may we submit totally to your, your rule, to your kindness, to your lordship. We love you. Please guide us this morning in your name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our journey in, uh, in, through the Gospels and in these uh, last days that we're in leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection. Last week, uh, we... we took a look at the, at the middle part of Matthew chapter 26. And we saw Jesus um, in his priestly role, we saw him uh, instituting, making clear a new covenant with his people, particularly in how he spoke and, and directed with his disciples in what we might refer to as the Last Supper or um, the Lord's Supper sometimes in that upper room as they were getting ready uh, to celebrate Passover. <clears throat> and he, he took the symbolism of that uh, very well-known Passover time and meal and celebration and made it very clear that what they had always known culturally for them of years way back when of how God had worked and provided for them and protected them and given them deliverance, that that was a foreshadowing of the fullness of what Christ was about to do of truly offering forgiveness of sins and making um, reconciliation, <laughs> making atonement for them with God that there would be nothing, nothing in the way anymore. We're going to continue off of that narrative. In fact, I'm going to back up one verse and remind us of where we left off. Um, and we are going to break it into our, our three chunks to look at. But I want, you to, I want you to hear this whole, for many of us, familiar passage. Many of the songs we just sang together actually um, get their inspiration from some of the little the little windows, the little pictures that we th see through this passage and the things that Jesus de did and said, um, you'll, you'll reflect back on the songs we just sang as we read through this. But I want you to hear it one time all together at the onset here. Um, and boy, you know, I, I, I can't make you do it. Uh, but to me, 
this is one of those times where in our busy world with everything packaged for us of movies and television and story and all those kinds of things, um, sometimes it, we, we are not exercised in our God-given ability to imagine, to put ourselves in the place of a real setting and scenario. And so I hope, as I read this morning, you're welcome to follow along, but I almost hope that you would close your eyes or that you would allow yourself into that, that experience of what was going on with Jesus and his disciples as he spoke, as he taught, as he moved with them through this day. Hear from the words of um, Matthew, inspired from, by the Holy Spirit, beginning in verse, 31 of Mass, or verse 30 of Matthew 26. We read, After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, will you all, sorry, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Verse 36. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, so you, make, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into the temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again and a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us, let us be going and behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. While he was speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who, who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. 
sees him. Immediately, Jesus went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will give me at once, sorry, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. We'll stop our reading there for this morning. Okay, um, <clears throat> we're going to walk through this morning, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through the passage in, in through three main chunks here. Uh, here's kind of the overarching idea. Even as Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he did not waver in his obedience to the Father and continued to trust in his plan to provide salvation. Um, As we walk through this, some of you in the room, and and certainly those who are joining elsewhere, uh, will have more Bible study experience, more times that you've gone over this material, or heard it talked about, or looked up questions that you may have. It'll be more familiar to some than for others. Likewise, with the whole of Scripture, some of us have more time, more history, more of a background with the Scriptures than others. So very briefly, I want to uh, just catch everyone up by way of review and remind you that the story, the account of Jesus and his earthly life and time um, with the disciples, with us as people, the things that he said and taught and places that he went and stuff, are covered in the first four books of what we call the New Testament. The Holy Spirit inspires that. They are four very different men that are used as those authors. And we believe that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gave them what to speak. Each one of those gospel writers has a unique lens or style to their writing, a unique audience or purpose of why they're writing. In our case this morning, we're reading out of the book of Matthew. Matthew's gospel, there's lots of ways to describe this, but the way I'm going to describe it is he is writing as a Jewish man to a Jewish audience, primarily to other Jews. And he is trying to convince them, to help them see the evidence that Jesus really is the prophesied Messiah. And so Matthew has three main streams through his gospel that he keeps highlighting. He keeps highlighting the prophetic nature of Jesus, the priestly nature of Jesus, and the kingly or the authority nature of Jesus. Because all of these were the key prophetic evidences that were passed down to the Hebrews through God's prophets of how they would be able to identify 
the Messiah. Okay? Prophet, priest, and king. He would serve in all of these roles in a perfect way and establish, according to the promises given, the covenant given, would establish a forever kingdom with God. Now, there's a lot more detail to that. That's a, that's a long Old Testament study to go through another day. But I want you to be armed with that understanding, that background, as we look at Matthew's gospel. For some of you who are churchy people or have grown up in Sunday school class and all those kinds of things, um, there's a few details of information that fit into this story that maybe as I was just reading the account, or certainly as we walk back through it, you're going you're to wonder, well, what about that part? <laughs> I, I remember this, <laughs> okay? And that's probably because what we're thinking of is a very parallel passage most of us are thinking uh, based on the words in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is a doctor. Luke loves to talk about the medical things, the details, the exact places, who was in charge, what time it was in the day, what was physically happening. He's a medical doctor, and he likes to write about those things and include those things. So I'll highlight a little bit of that when we get there. Okay. With all that... Uh, drape work in place. Let's get to the passage at hand. Um, we're different people. In a lot of ways, in many things, perhaps like many stereotypical guys, I'm not always superly upfront with my emotions. They usually don't get the better of me in most settings. The, pro the pulpit is not one of those settings. And this passage is not one of those times for me. So I will just let you know, there's a very good chance there will be moments that um, choke me up because of the passion, not to steal some uh, uh, Latin perspective, but because of the passion that is displayed here. Here we go. Our first main point that we want to highlight in, in the beginning of the passage is the Son of Man predicts abandonment. He predicts that there's going to be abandonment. I backed up a verse, and we picked up right where we left off last week, and we're reminded that as Jesus is finishing up with the disciples in the upper room, this Passover celebration, he wraps it all up, they wrap it up, with singing at least one, maybe more, singing hymns, singing praise, remembrance to God, giving thanksgiving for his provision. Some of that was just very fitting with the Passover celebration. I only come back to it again and... and and highlight, to me, it's very interesting from an emotional standpoint. As far as going through the motions of the tradition, totally makes sense for the setting. And that may very well be what, what is motivating or what was behind that. But from an emotional sense, us, in our privileged position, being able to see the fullness of who Jesus is, and what's about to unfold in the next few hours and a couple of days. What a beautiful picture to see the humility and the obedience, we're going to see this several times, of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is about to be slain for your and my sins and all people of all time, looking towards the very, um, the climax moments of stress and discomfort, the law before the storm, the anticipation of what is coming, and how does he respond to it? Like later on, Peter and Silas take a page from Jesus' book here. 
when they're sitting in prison, locked in bonds. What is he doing? He's leading them in worship, in praise, in celebration, just remembering the character of God. I think that's a, just a, a, a beautiful, wonderful place to start because it's about to get a lot more uncomfortable, right? Verse 31, then Jesus said to them, you're all going to fall away because of me tonight. We have to start there. Don't miss this. There is a, different translations are going to phrase it slightly differently. Um, but there is this, this phrase right there, you will fall away. You're going to leave because of me. Some of your translations might have in account of me or in offense of me. That language offense is accurate. That's what this word here means. Means I'm going to do something tonight and it's going to rub you the wrong way and your response to it is you're going to leave me. You're going to go. You're going to abandon me. That's a weird way to finish a worship service. We don't do that here, do we? It's uncomfortable. Jesus has brought them through a few uncomfortable things now, and here's another one. You're going to fall away tonight. Not, oh, you know, probably, it's not some generic hypothetical, playing the numbers game sort of thing. It's not like what I might do as a pastor where I might say, hey, in a crowd this size, we understand statistics and stuff. Some of you will believe. Some of you, maybe we would point to the parable of the sower and the seed and the various styles that are there. Some of you know you're really going to get this. You're really going to take God seriously. Some of you, it's going to be harder and you're going to kind of stumble and fall away. Some of you, as soon as you hit some hard circumstances, you'll walk away. This is not a generic teaching Jesus is giving here. He's saying tonight, something's going down. And all y'all is leaving. Look at what he says right after that. And after this is all done, I'll head to Galilee before you and we'll meet up there. Isn't that interesting? I love, hmm, I, if I was them, I wish Jesus would just make things abundantly clear, like smack me in the face with the details, right? That's what I want if I'm in the situation. But look at how Jesus is already weaving the discomfort and the harshness of the reality that he knows is coming with little glimmers of grace and hope that he also knows is coming. You're going to walk away. You need to know this. There's some parts of it that you need to be aware of. I don't know if that's, if that's just him looking towards the healing process later, if that's just to give them enough that they can navigate and see how things begin to piece together. I don't know all the motivation, and it doesn't make, us, uh, make it abundantly clear. But he's already saying, this is going to happen, and... I'm going to go to that. I'm going to go to one of our places in Galilee and, and we're going to meet up eventually. Okay. Now, I don't know. Hmm, it's not one of those places where we get a clause that tell us. But the next thing we find out is somebody, um, somebody speaks up, right? Peter's going to speak up. And it seems as if he gets the Jesus is saying something rough is going down and we're going to leave. And that's what cl clicks in his mind. He kind of skims over the rest, right? So look at where Peter goes. Love Peter. Oh, I, I, it's in my notes. I get passionate and then I skip my notes and that frustrates some of you. 
I want you to, to know the statement that Jesus makes there, and you can see it's in maybe different type or whatnot in your text. Uh, maybe it's got quotes around it. This is a quote coming from the prophet Zechariah. It comes from Zechariah 13.7. That's what Jesus is quoting here, this prophecy of um, the shepherd being struck, being affected, and so the sheep scatter, right? Um, it just comes from a, an everyday practical life picture of what would happen with shepherds and sheep, and it's being used in, in the context of leadership, and it's prophetic of what's happening here with Jesus, right? As the shepherd, remember Jesus in John uh, 10 refers to himself as the good shepherd. As the shepherd is, is struck, is affected, then everybody else is going to, to scatter, is going to leave. Peter speaks up. Love Peter. Love Peter because he brings in that wonderful um, human part of us, right? But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. A little bit later, verse uh, 35, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. We are not going to make fun of Peter. I love what he's saying here. I think he means what he's saying here. I hope you have Peter moments in your devotions, in your experience, in your growth path with God. Times of that Mm, that gritty resolve within you of, I'm in this with you, Lord. Please hold on to me. Keep me with you because I don't want to give up. I, uh, for us, I'm, I'm kind of off the, the time and the text for a moment, but for us, we, we've, got the, we've got the story plan laid out for us. We know some of what's coming. Maybe we don't understand all the details. But we know that there will be trials and tribulations in this life. We know there will be seasons of celebration and seasons of grief. We have some warning about how life works and this arc of this plan that God has. And that there might be really, really hard things. And and nations and countries and, and rulers and powers clash with each other and fight with each other and kill people and kingdoms rise and fall and we are called to be faithful, to pass on the truth, to live warm, loving, um, winsome lives along people who may hate us who may be uncomfortable with us, who may be looking and going a totally different direction than us, who may be having an influence on our families that we don't like. And we are called to navigate all of this stuff in history and in life in submitted, humble, modest, um, balanced obedience with God each step of the way, right? So we're not going to make fun of Peter, but we are going to hold on to this. He passionately argues with Jesus. Don't you love that? You ever had those, that moment? That might vary between our personalities and styles, but in your quiet place, that secret place where you're just you and God, some of you are sweet even there. Some of us look a lot like our children and grandchildren when we're there. And we get a little angsty and selfish. We see things from our perspective and it's hard to get out and see it from any other perspective. And, and I love the beauty here of Peter just saying, hmm. I hear what you're saying, Jesus, and I don't like it. <laughs> if, if this is a, I can almost hear him. It's not in the text, so be careful. I can almost hear him saying, if this is a test, I don't want to fail it. I'm telling you right now, I'm paying attention, and I'm, I'm not going to let it go down that way. 
we cheat, don't we, in, in our time now, because we're looking back at Scripture. We know what's going to happen, many of us, but at the very least, we know Peter's track record and Jesus' track record. And when Jesus says things are going to happen this way, they happen that way. And some of us are going, hey, Peter, hold on. Ask a few clarifying questions for us. Do some follow-up. Hold your tongue for a moment and ask, what's, what's going to happen? Or how is this so? Or what, what should I do about it? Something. Help us out. But it seems that Peter there in the moment, there's a passion to it. I love that it shows that the disciples, as, as many times as we get hints that they're not totally grasping all of where Jesus is coming from and how all of this plan fits together and exactly what his time frame is or, or that his end goal is, is, is not the, the traditional interpretation of an earthly kingdom right now and everything changes and our circumstances get all better that they're hoping for and that they're used to hearing about, even though they don't seem to quite totally get it, look, all the disciples said the same thing too. Now that might be a little bit of a lesson in peer pressure, but I think there's some sincerity here, right? Right? They've gone through some sensitive moments with Jesus right now. They know the tensions that have been building. They're, they've been faithful. They're following with him. They want to be there with him. They want him to know we're together in this. And if things get hard, we're going to go through it with you. Okay. Need to move to the next point, but I'm... <laughs> I'm taking time to drive it home here because we're going to... This idea that Jesus boldly says, tonight you're going to walk away because you're going to be offended with me. Hold on to that in your minds because in a little bit I'm going to ask you, what was the offense? What offense was there? So hold on to this. Okay. Moving on to our last point in this section, and then we got to keep moving. We need to be careful that we do not underestimate and underprepare for the testing and trials of this life. This is not meant as a backhanded comment toward Peter or the disciples here but rather that we can learn from some of what we see because God reveals it to us in his word, this track record with people. We need to be aware of the tendency folks. (laughs) Y'all are the people who show up at church in this time, in this culture today. I know that because you're here, right? This moment, times like this, when we're gathered, when we have prayer gatherings, when we're doing some special event, when we're the church, the gathered ones, okay? That is wonderful and beautiful, and I'm looking for... I'm looking forward to that being permanent. Those are the easy moments, not the hard moments. Even here, when God starts stirring among us and we feel conviction and we respond to him, as important as that is and how that can be a benchmark in our lives and, and, and be the difference of trajectory for us that's super important, Even that is not made evident. It's not proved until we experience the next temptation, the next trial, the next difficulty. Until it's tested, it's just a good moment. The proof isn't there yet. 
please hear the word of caution, not so much from my lips, but from everyone who has gone before us in faith. Don't underestimate how subtly and quickly, to use our current language, the stresses of life, the difficulties, the not being able to see what comes next, and so we play with the what-ifs and the unknowns in our mind. All these subtle things, the, 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 the changes in culture and values, the language around us that we're hearing, how easy it is when we're in this setting to say something similar in our hearts like Peter. God, I'm so, I'm just glad to be with you. This is so wonderful. We love you so much. You've taught us so much. You've done so much with us. I can't wait till, till, till heaven. I'm just looking forward to being with you forever. This is all good things. But don't underestimate how quickly the circumstances can change and allow for that to make the difference of your faith. Do I trust you or not? I think I can say it one more time more succinctly. Don't make your comfort the foundation of your faith. It will be shaken. It's just a matter of time. That's not the place to build the foundation. We can see that here. Okay, let's go into our next section. Next few verses here, picking up in verse 36, continuing on. So they leave the upper room, right? They come down the steps. They head out of town. Uh, I don't even know if I'm going the right direction. But they head over uh, slightly to the east, out the eastern gate. They head over to uh, Gethsemane, the garden place by the Mount of Olives, this beautiful place. Uh, it's still there. Uh, the olive trees are mostly still there. The mountain is still there. Uh, you can travel over there. You can see this beautiful place. Um, we know that Jesus has been there before. He liked to go there to, to be alone, to have some peace, to have some time uh, with God. He goes there with the group of disciples. He tells the large group, hey, you guys stay here. Keep watch and pray for me. He takes a few more, right? Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. He takes them with him a little bit further. And they pray, right? And then he goes, a little bit, he goes a little bit beyond them, and he begins to pray. What's he praying about? He's praying about the immediate circumstances at hand in this case, right? Jesus is looking to what is about to happen, and specifically, he doesn't, he doesn't in this gospel, he doesn't give specific words to the details of how it's going to happen, but he makes reference to what he calls this cup, right? If this set of circumstances that we've agreed upon before the foundations of the earth <laughs> that I knew was coming, that is the reason, the motivation for me coming to this earth is to deal with this problem in this way, if I'm going to have to die and suffer and be humiliated, and I, th I think I have an interpretation bias here that I think I can make good argument for. In these various windows here, and even once Jesus is on the cross, my personal bias is I don't think his bigger, biggest stressor is the anticipation of the physical pain even though that's definitely, that's for sure, part of the mixture, right? It seems to me that where Jesus is putting, on, is putting the emphasis is he knows he is about to take on, 
How do I say this so I don't lead you in a weird direction? He is about to take on the sins of the whole world. Why do I argue that? Uh, I don't have time for all the reasons. At the end of the reason list is Jesus is God. Knowledge-wise, not that that fixes everything, but intellectually, he knows the plan. He decided on the plan. He's good with the plan. He knows that it is not going to be his end. He is eternal. He knows, I believe, it is consistent, he knows that he's going to conquer this. What he does, boy, i got to be real careful here. God has never experienced taking on the sins of the world himself until this moment. That's his, I, I want to be careful about calling it the unknown. <laughs> I don't know enough for certain, of exactly how God's knowledge works. But that's the new thing. That's the big thing. Everything else fits into it. There's plenty of stress to go around in this scenario. Go over to Dr. Luke. Remember I made reference that he has more details? Dr. Luke gives us some medical clues and evidence. Remember how it talks about that Jesus, he describes himself here, the sorrow, being sorrowful even unto death. Dr. Luke says, we observed that he was sweating and there was blood mixed in with it, that he was sweating in a way that there were blood drops in that. Well, I don't have time for all of it, but we know that that's an actual medical condition that comes from, from ongoing severe stress. Okay, That can still happen today, and it's got lots of uncomfortable side effects to it. Okay? That's a real thing. Well, Dr. Luke gives us those clues. We know that he's stressed. It's coming to understand what, what we see as Scripture reveals it to us of why is he stressed. Well, there's the physical things that he's going to have to endure. Right? You know from other studies, the Romans are experts in the form of of punishment and torture and ultimately capital punishment death that he's about to experience. This is their gig. They got, pe they got paid people who make extra money within their, their ranks just to do this job really well. By really well, I mean make it a supreme example to the whole world that no one would dare to rise up against Rome. That's how they use this. The physical stuff is certainly there. But don't miss that the miraculous of what God is about to do is not about overcoming the physical discomforts. It's about overcoming sin itself and taking away its power that it no longer has an eternal claim on anyone who would submit their lives to Jesus. That's what's going to go down. Right? Okay. The Son of Man trusts in God's plan. Jesus says here in our text that he is sorrowful, that he is, some, some translations use anguishing, that he is in deep distress, right? Again, this isn't because he doesn't understand. It's not because he doesn't know. It isn't because he doesn't have hope, right? <laughs> There's something beyond anything we comprehend going on with this. But it is, it's affecting his physical body. He is thinking about it. And he is addressing it in the most powerful way. 
right? Does he, he doesn't get together with his disciples and say, hey guys, I've, I've been talking with my father and there's some bad stuff about to happen tonight. So here's what we're going to do. You need to leave from here and you need to go out and get everybody who's been loyal to me. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? The zealot. Uh, is it the other Simon? Simon the zealot? Yes. Go talk to your terrorist buddies. That's what they were. Go talk to them. Get any armaments that you've got hidden from the Romans. We're going to need them. Right? How do we know that they were thinking armaments? Because in a moment we're going to see what Peter, or he's unnamed in, this, in Matthew's version, Peter's got a sword stashed on him. Do you know that wasn't lawful at the time? Under the Roman occupation, they can't carry a traditional sword. What, is it, what are they calling a sword here? It's a big kitchen knife. It's probably one not designed for in the kitchen. It's designed for, he's a fisherman, right? It's designed for utilitarian work for men that they were allowed to carry. But don't think the Roman gladius. Don't think the nice, short, fancy sword that the Romans are using around town. That's not what he's got. He's got a chunk of bronze or very cheap steel hammered in a cold forge to try to get enough of a sharpness on it that he can use it for cutting fish and doing some odd jobs around the house. That's what he's got. Jesus doesn't go that path. He doesn't get them ready in that way, right? He takes them out and he arms them. He gets ready. He prepares for the showdown of all of history by going to the most powerful place, the very throne of his father in prayer. And when he gets there, he talks about this cup. And there is this submission that we see over and over again here. Um, that we sang about before we got started. Right? And it's said a couple of different ways in those few verses. But he keeps coming back to... Lord, if there's, he starts with, if there's any way, if there's a plan B, right? If there's any other way, let's go that route. But, not my will, but yours. He comes back to it, right? Because he goes and he checks on his disciples. We're not, we'll come back to that for a moment. He comes back and... Uh, Again, he, he goes away and prays, and uh, it's, uh, uh, the second one. Uh, my father, if this, can't, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. He iterates this over and over again. I'm not going to take time right now to deal with all of, uh, you know, Jesus comes back several times and checks on his disciples. They're sleeping, and he talks to them about that. Other than I want you to catch here this high value of prayer that Jesus has. And so to me, in studying, it brought up the question, do we value this incredible gift of prayer that we've been invited into. We've had it illustrated for us. Jesus' disciples had actual direct teaching on it a little bit, um, which we get, to, we get to jump in on. It's been saved for us as well, right? Do we really value that in the same way that Jesus does? Because Jesus doesn't just give us a big teaching of, okay, you, you followers, you need to think better about this. You need to do this before you do anything else. It's, it's not some harsh teaching. 
He simply lives it out time and time again and makes it very, very clear through his example, this is where the real power is. This is where your hope is. You've got to be in in harmony, in alignment, in communication with the Father. Boy, I can't, I can't let this go yet. That has to start with, first, the line of communication has to be open. There's two things that shut down the line of communication. They're tied together, aren't they? The first one is direct disobedience, sin. Sin severs the relationship and causes a big problem in communication with God. And that's coupled right with our, our will. We have, to be, um, we have to be living. We have to be open. We have to initiate prayer and communication with God. That'll get, those two things will get in the way and shut it down. Then when we pray, how are we supposed to be pray- how are we supposed to pray? We pray in humility, we pray in faith, and we pray in alignment, or some tr- passages um, you might imply empowerment by the Holy Spirit. What does that imply? It implies I'm not looking for my will. It implies I'm looking for whatever God is wanting to do. There's a transforming process that happens through real prayer. When we hang out with God, what changes? God doesn't change. That would be scary. What changes when we spend our time with God and are communicating with him? I change. My mind changes, my focus changes, my interpretation of things changes. He is instructing me. He's giving me new direction or clarity or understanding. I'm not informing him like he doesn't know. Okay, I got to keep moving, huh? Over and over again here, uh, there's, if you want the specific verses, they're up on the, up on the screen. Um, the Son, Jesus, expresses his submissive harmony with the will of the Father over and over in these ways. Later on, we're going to catch that again when he's even on the cross. We're going to see that continuing to take place. Right? The Son of Man exercises restraint. I've been looking forward to this part. Maybe this is just for me, but you get to join in. I want you to catch in verse 46 whether this is supernatural awareness or whether this is observation of sound, lamplight, commotion going on. Notice in verse 46, we already see that Jesus knows what is coming. Right then, in the immediate. That speaks to his broader understanding of he knows what is about to come, that certainly is supernatural. It is his understanding with God and planning ahead, right? But we can see even in this moment, he's telling the disciples, okay, guys, you've had as much rest as you're going to get. Time to get up. Um, time, time to look alert. It's going down right now. See, even my betrayer is at hand. Judas, Judas comes up. Now, today, Judas is not going to be our main character and get the limelight, even though we're talking about the betrayal. But you know the story of Jesus, Judas. Even last week we, we mentioned that some has already taken place. He has a, 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 a pre-arranged um, plan with the religious leaders, particularly the high priests and, and the high priest's servants, um, that he's going to portray Jesus. So he's been looking for an opportunity. This is it. Jesus is going to be outside of the city 
at nighttime in a, a place that most people don't go to at night. You know, they're at home in their beds, but it's a nice garden place. It's away from town. There aren't so many prying eyes. This is a good opportunity if we're going to do something controversial, if we're going to arrest him anytime, this is our best shot. Okay? We don't have those words in Scripture, but that's what would, is going down, right? So Judas comes, he's got a sign, hey, watch me, whoever it is that I go up and, and give a kiss to, a greeting kiss to, that's, that's the one, that's the one you need to arrest, right? So Judas comes, he goes up to Jesus, and uh, I, I think this is a wonderful example of overacting. Hail Jesus! I think he said it as warm and gushy as he could muster in the moment to cover over his falsehood and, um, and probably already deep sense of conviction. I say that because in a short while we're going to see that he's convicted because he's going to be very uncomfortable with himself and, and make some yucky choices. But he goes up, he greets Jesus with this warm friendship greeting and gives him a kiss. Why am I taking time with that? How does Jesus respond? This just gripped my heart this time going back through. Friend. He responds, friend. Do what you have come for. He doesn't light into him, does he? He doesn't berate him. He doesn't lecture him. He doesn't even in his knowledge say, I hope you're happy with yourself. I hope you get all that you think you deserve out of this. Isn't that how we would act? I'm sure you've got your own version. Wouldn't we be aggressive or passive aggressive at least? Wouldn't, wouldn't we want to get our last two cents in here? Make sure he felt uncomfortable? We don't see that. Jesus isn't, doesn't seem to be gushy, but he matter-of-factly, he plainly calls him friend and acknowledges this is what is going to happen, this is what has to happen. We don't need all of your show with this pale Jesus kissy stuff. Let's just move forward and do what you've come to do. That's met with right after that. In, in Matthew, it, it leaves him unnamed. Matthew's so polite. Matthew just says, and one of those with him, right? Not Luke. Luke is like, it was Peter. I'm telling you it was Peter. Okay. Peter did it. Um, we're told Peter reveals this sword, this knife that he has, and he lashes out in defense, in anger. We don't know all of the inward motive. We're not told for certain but he lashes out, he hacks off the ear of this servant of the high priest. And here in Matthew's gospel, Jesus uses it as a teaching moment. Right? I don't want to miss that, at least in Luke's gospel, we're also told, and some of you good Sunday school people will remember, we're told that Jesus actually bends down, picks up the ear, puts it back on, and heals it. And that plays into the story. But here, Jesus uses it as a teaching moment. Hey, put that thing away. I'm telling you, the people who choose to live that way, to lash out in anger and violence, those who are going to live by the sword, who are going to make it their go-to, are going to live aggressively, trying to fight their way through the world, it's going to be the death of them. It's going to be their demise. You can take that as literally or as life uh, um, uh, practice teaching way as you will. He stops it. 
He stops it. He says, put that away. That's not how this is going to happen. Do you remember just a few verses back, at the beginning of me rambling on, what we were talking about? Unless Peter totally doubts Jesus' understanding and credibility, we have to assume Jesus, Peter's plan, his strategy, is not that Jesus is wrong and nothing's going to happen tonight. But somehow in my loyalty... In my love, in my being, I can intercede and I'm going to do something about it. So I'm going to put this knife in my pocket or with me. And when the moment comes, he is not a chicken. This is a gutsy dude who is potentially outnumbered, certainly out authoritied. He pulls this thing out. He makes good on his promise. He is there for Jesus. He is going to take this to the physical limits. He is going to risk his life, his wealth, his happiness, his well-being, his family. We know that Peter's married. He is putting it all on the line. He is going to be with Jesus. And Jesus says, no! He stops him. We're not going to do that. You know what the plan is? I'm going to walk back with them. I'm going to let them do whatever it is in their hearts to do. The Messiah, the Savior, the Champion, the one who's supposed to fix everything forever, the one who is supposed to lay all other authorities bare and at their knees admitting that he is Lord and there is no other, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the creator, the one who just looks at Peter and tells him, do you doubt that I could just quickly have a conversation with my father and he would send me more than 12 legions? Of angels. I don't know how many angels it takes to deal with a few piddly humans with clubs, but I don't think it's many. For you guys, because you all are funny with me, this is 62,000 to 72,000 is what 12 legions would be, in case you're wondering how many angels he's got access to. Do you doubt that I could do that? This is not a physical confrontation. I could have this done in a moment. I could take over everything. But here's the plan from the beginning of time. I'm going to go with them and submit to their godlessness, their false accusations, their their humiliating actions, their lies. I'm just going to to take it. I told you I'd do this. At the end of this passage that we just read, verse um, oh, 56 here, right? The very last phrase. Then, they, then all the disciples left him and fled. Why? What was the big offense? What made Jesus unpalatable in their eyes in that moment? He wasn't going to rise up with them. He wasn't going to call them to be the heroes and fight. There was going to be nothing physically that they could do. So if they stayed with him, they associate with him, and they take on all the physical risks, all of the cultural risks, all of the dangers of the authorities, 
while watching their leader humbly walk away, putting up no fight at all. They know what the Romans can do. They've seen crosses before. They know the likelihood of where this is going. They know the venom in the hearts of the religious leaders and how they've been treating Jesus and talking about him around town. There was no secret of any of this. They can either stay there and be embarrassed or in trouble themselves, or they have to flee into the night and deal with the unknowns and the emotions and the fears and the doubts and what nonsense have I gotten myself into? Is this some sort of weird cult? What is coming of it? That's what they've got to wrestle with, at least for that night. Just them and God. They all run away and leave him. I love that we see uh, a comparison uh, here, a contrast between Peter's aggressive, well-meaning obedience, or not obedience, but uh, protection plan here, right? Versus Jesus being full of grace, and he is just steady. I love the word poised as he walks through this. Okay, I gotta let you go. Here we go. I'm still wrestling with personal application myself, but here's, here's something to maybe help along the way. Because we have been saved, those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, because we've been saved through the sacrifice of Jesus, we embrace suffering, don't we? Think about that phrase just for a moment before we go. We embrace suffering. Please don't invite suffering. Please don't go looking for it or instigating it. But when there is offense because of the gospel, because of Jesus, we embrace that kind of suffering as we follow in the footsteps of our Savior whose mission it was to seek and to save the lost. If it's going to cost me while I'm faithfully, honestly on the mission of seeking and saving the lost, then it's worthwhile. Then it's honorable. Right? It's not my place to decide how the world is going to treat me. Jesus already said they're not going to be real thrilled. Okay? But I don't need to be abrasive. I can follow also what the Apostle Paul warns us in Romans 12, where he says, so much as it depends on you, which it doesn't always, <laughs> but so much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There are times when we embrace the suffering that comes because it helps us to see it comes with being on the path with Jesus. Can I pray with you? Lord, this is uncomfortable scripture because uh, as much as we're looking back and we know how the story goes, it's hard to look at these dark days that you experienced with people just like me condemning you and ridiculing you and well-meaning people, again, like me, who think they've got your back, but when push comes to shove, we don't know what to do with you, and it checks us, and we are fearful, and we've got to once again come to the place of submission, come to grips with, yes, you really do have the rights to be Lord, and that means you get to do things the way you want to do them. Lord, help us to live ongoingly that way. That not just with words or churchy sentiment, 
but with the purposefulness of our own wills, we decide to submit to you as Lord each day to look for your rule, to look and purposely do things your way, to take, to take hold of those opportunities to live by faith instead of our own understanding and to celebrate, to see what it is you do because of it. Lord, may you be first in each and every one of our lives. And when suffering comes, because, because of a world fighting against you, that not out of arrogance or self-protection, but out of quiet strength and humility, we will be able to embrace and accept it as, as the opportunity to be right in step with you. Thank you for all you've done on our behalf, Lord, and for the salvation that we have only in you and the hope of glory in your kingdom. You are beautiful. We love you. Amen. Thank you all for taking a look at Jesus with me again. You are dismissed to go and uh, love the Lord. Love the Lord, yes, love the Lord. Love the people around you like Jesus. You're dismissed.